ready for panel number two. And so here we learned about people being dragged along, don't really want to get all the way there. Everyone has their own individual narratives and has their own space to tell it. And so the way that leaves us now is let's talk to the people who have to deal with all of that at one time, the public officials. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, you know, our surveys reflect that people don't like how things are being handled. And, uh, and, and it's not that they all don't like it for the same reason. And so uh, our next panelists are the people who have to address that and find the right way to do it. We learned from the last panel that it took some leadership to move things along, even though the majority of people didn't want certain things done. And so I'm interested to hear what our next panel, pan, our panel will offer us. Uh, we have people from, from different levels of state government. Of course, we have uh, Senator Marlon Kempson, who is a, former, uh, a forum alum and good friend and, and even better lawyer. And uh, speaking of good friends and lawyers, Ross Appel is a city councilman uh, who can discuss uh, really how Charleston has been tackling these issues. And also along with that, from a different seat at the table, we'll have Mayor John Tecklenburg discussing that with us. And yet from another perspective, we have my good friend and yours and your city councilman, Reverend Kylon Middleton. And we couldn't have a better moderator help uh, arrange these different perspectives and address public policy issues as someone who's been um, doing it a lot in Columbia and is, has just been a uh, universally admired president of the University of South Carolina, Dr. Harris Pastides. Could you please join us? I look forward to panel number two. Thank you. We had a good time listening to the uh, historians uh, uh, talk about looking at the past and bringing us right up to about now. But this group, this group is comprised of people with responsibility and obligation to you, to us. We need to move forward. And we're going to talk for the next hour or so about how we do that. Who decides what happens? Is it a consensus? Is it a vote? What do you do when there's reasonable disagreement? We're going to delve into all of those. What is the Heritage Act? How did it start? Who controls that? Uh, and, and so this will be uh, exciting, and nobody's going to be off the hook here. Uh, by the end of this hour, we're going to try to come to a consensus about how Charleston, the city, the county, the low country, maybe even America can move forward. But I'm going to hearken back to the first panel for a moment. I heard two panelists somewhat ambivalent about removing statues or even renaming buildings. And if I remember, they said, on one hand, it's like erasing memories. On, and the other individual said, you lose an opportunity to educate and to learn. You could put the statue in a museum, and people can still go to that museum to contextualize and to learn, but you're not going to be walking by it every day. So let's start with that. We're going to spend most of our time talking about moving forward and public policy. But let me, a quick speed round here, ask whether you believe, in fact, whether the removal of, uh, of statues or renaming of buildings for people who are odious in contemporary society, does that actually diminish an opportunity that we have to learn from what those people did? Mayor, can we start with you? Well, we'll go down, well, we'll go um, down the line. I could actually talk on this topic for the rest of the evening. Um, just with our experiences with, with the Calhoun statue over a few couple of years ago. And, and so let me just share um, my belief, and I, I think our council's belief is that um, the path forward is to tell more of the story of our history and those stories of our community. And um, the, the case of Mr. Calhoun's statue, in my view, was, was a very special one. And, and uniquely, we tried as a council I think before Ross got on the council, to come up with some historical verbiage text about Mr. Calhoun that we would have added to 
uh, close to the um, uh, base of the statue because you couldn't actually um, maybe put it on the statue depending on your interpretation of the Heritage Act. But anyway, um, that didn't pass. We couldn't even agree on city council as to words that would go and, and, and contextualize, tell the story of Mr. Calhoun. And so, so this is the thing, in my view. When you're on a pedestal, when you're on a pedestal, that's, that's a place of honor. And, and that particular statue was on the highest pedestal in the city of Charleston. And we weren't even telling that whole story. We weren't able to tell that whole story. We couldn't even agree on that. And I think that story needs to be te told in the right place, in a museum. But, but to have Mr. Calhoun on, on the highest pedestal in our city, in effect, the highest place of honor, um, I just felt was inappropriate. And council, council agreed with that a couple of years. And um, I, I guess if y'all will allow me a, a little further commentary, and I'm not a historian, I, I was a chemistry major, but, but it, it really occurred to me um, after reading Blaine's book and giving tours of Marion Square to the prospective designers of, of the Mother Emanuel Memorial that hopefully we'll break ground on later this year, just how out of place the statue was in the place that it was. Again, we need to tell the story. But, but think about this. In 1850, 51, when Mr. Calhoun died, about 75% of white Charlestonians uh, were slave owners. 75%. And this was a time in our country's history where that argument between abolition and slave holding was, was coming up to, to its highest pitch, right? And so here comes a guy, Mr. Calhoun, who basically provided the juicy rationaliz rationalization, the philosophical underpinning about owning slaves. And, and, and it was so prevalent in the culture. I mean, he became so venerated by those white Charlestonians and, and, and folks who were slave owners. So, so that led to this veneration of him. But, and, and I know you can talk all night long about Mr. Calhoun, but, but here's the bottom line for me. Our founding fathers based our declaration of independence that all men were created equal. Did they not? Mr. Calhoun ultimately did not believe that. Thank you. Reverend Middleton, Councilman, what do you think? Does, do, do, does removing the uh, odious and making people less vulnerable and, and all of that, do you lose something with that? Certainly, I believe that um, those relics should be removed. Um, those symbols are abhorrent you know, to the psyche and to the hopes of individuals who are in the shadows of them. I'm a native Charlestonian. I grew up on the east side of Charleston, which is right over here. And we clearly knew back in those days, particularly where the Calhoun statue, since we're talking about Calhoun, that that was a, a line of demarcation, specifically for black people, going across Calhoun Street there was uh, a, a, an economic, a socioeconomic um, distinction, and there was uh, a caste sort of imperative that certain people stayed on this side and other people who were more affluent were permitted to pass on that side. And the Calhoun statue or monument presided over <laughs> that sort of uh, philosophy, worldview, or mentality mindset during the time. And as a young boy, particularly a student at Courtney School, which is literally straight down this street, I had a paper route. And as a young person, just trying to earn money, and I had to go get my newspapers. It was the Evening Post at that time. I, I would have to get my newspapers at Colonial Lake, and I would have to walk through uh, Marion Square un under the canopy of this Calhoun statue and was always reminded that certain 
parts of Charleston were not necessarily afforded to me, which then caused me to be a little bit more resilient and a lot more determined to chase after that dream. Can you imagine other young people like myself growing up during times where it was not necessarily the spoken narrative, but it became the symbolic um, sort of thing right in your face that reminded you of these systems of oppression, these systems that uh, were, were set in stone, you know, almost proverbially, to keep certain people in a particular place as it relates to our uh, social structure. And so when you look at those statues in context, without a proper um, telling of those stories, even a counter narrative, because there were no counter narratives being given uh, to young people like myself at the time. We just heard, and even our parents told us, don't go beyond this point. I mean, we were told that in our homes because that was what was passed down to them. That became the prevailing philosophy, and that created almost a culture or subculture of oppression. And so when looking at the monuments that exist in and around the city, particularly in front of River School and other places, you know, we talked about the other panel talked about the flag and I celebrated Brie Newsom when she just went and yanked the thing down, you know, because it seemed as though we marched in the 90s for it. So these sorts of things continue to uh, create, at least for a civil society, unbalance. And so taking them down, in my opinion, and placing them in museums and other places where individuals can go to them and learn about them, as opposed to being confronted with them. And if an unbalanced narrative had been at least presented, uh, psychologically impeded in their ability to even hope more than for themselves uh, what they could see if no one is there to interpret that and or to give them a counter to that narrative. So I think that they should be taken down, they should be placed in appropriate places uh, where, the, where individuals can be taught uh, to have a view of those relics in, in the context that they actually existed. Thank you, thank you. Senator. Sure, thank you for the question. And um, it's interesting, um, the views on this in the General Assembly. Uh, we have a a number of modern day Confederate soldiers uh, who espouse the support uh, for the relics and monuments. Uh, during the debate, uh, I read from two people that I thought would be most persuasive representative on the subject. Uh, it was General uh, Wade Hampton and this is what General Wade Hampton, a Confederate soldier from South Carolina, said about the Confederate flag and other war monuments. He gave a speech in 1875, and it was called Duty of the Present. And this speech was given to soldiers, though it will never again brave the battle and the breeze, yet as long as one shred of its battle-scarred foes cling to another, it will tell you in language more eloquent than words of the imperishable renown you won for it and for yourselves. It will speak constantly to your hearts of our dead comrades and it will serve to you remind and remind you always that when you furl the flag forever, you pledge your solidarity, honor to observe inviolate the terms on which you surrender. And then we have uh, General Robert E. Lee, who essentially says the same thing. Should unite, we should unite in an honored effort to obliterate the effects of the war and restore the blessings of peace. Let Lee's orders and the terms of surrender were to furl the flag. And so against that backdrop, we have Confederate generals who actually fought, unlike the modern day uh, representatives in the state legislature who have simply witnessed this moment through history and their own version of uh, being educated. Uh, but the people who had blood and placed their 
their lives in harm's way for their own belief actually thought it was a good idea. Uh, they recognized that the war was fought and lost. And in order for this nation to move forward, we have to leave those things in the past. Now, uh, let me just say this. We've spent far too much time on this in the General Assembly. South Carolina leads the nation, uh, arguably the worst in the nation when it comes to the quality of life of its citizens in education, in health care, in livable wage. The number of hours that we spend debating these subjects uh, is a shame. And so I would much rather spend my attention in 2022 uh, on addressing the matters uh, specifically when it, as it relates to African Americans of economic empowerment, something you'll hear me talk more about tonight. Thank you. We have a uh, women's residence hall named Wade Hampton. We have another one named Sims, as in J. Marion Sims. So you can imagine the relevance of what we're talking about to our campus. In fact, approximately 20 buildings on campus have been recommended for renaming, but you run right into the uh, will, the force of, uh, of state government. And I'll tell you a little bit later what we are doing about that, but Ross Appel, city councilman, Give us your opening here. All right, thank you, Mr. President. And um, first off, I just wanted to say uh, thank you, and it's such an honor and a privilege to be here this evening. Uh, my name's Ross Appel. For those of y'all who do not know me, uh, I'm a fourth generation Charlestonian, and I'm honored to represent District 11, uh, which are the oldest neighborhoods in West Ashley and James Island. Um, you know, I still remember the time um, Mayor Tecklenburg called me up. It was shortly after um, the, uh, the, the terrible uh, incident involving George Floyd. And he called me up and, it, and the message was simple. And he said to me, uh, it's time to bring the Calhoun statue down. And he said, what do you, what do you think? And um, I, I believe I've got this uh, version of the events uh, re re remembered correctly. I, I believe without hesitation, I said, it's, it's time. Let's do it. And um, I'll give a you know, different perspective on the Calhoun statue. I think my colleagues up here have covered some really great ground. Uh, I'm Jewish, and right underneath uh, Mr. Calhoun was a Holocaust memorial. So think about the mixed messages the city of Charleston uh, was sending for years, for, for almost all of my life growing up here in Charleston. Here we're going to exalt Mr. Calhoun to the highest you know, uh, position in the city, and then we're going to honor the tragedy of the Holocaust where six million Jews, but millions of other uh, minorities and dissidents and other folks um, were killed just because of who they were. And it, it's not too much of a um, uh, intellectual leap to get from John C. Calhoun and some of his uh, principles and some of his philosophies to what, what causes the dehumanization and ultimate um, terrorization and, and ultimately, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the final solution. And I think that uh, by, by removing the Calhoun statue, we've brought a little bit more of a balance uh, to the city square uh, over, over in Marion Square. But by that same token, um, I represent a 95% white district uh, over in the city of Charleston. And I hope we get to talk about uh, zoning and land use and some really, um, you know, boring but important stuff that the city of Charleston deals with later. We'll talk a little bit about why we get to a place where there's 95% white people uh, living in a district in the city of Charleston. But suffice to say, there's a lot of folks in my constituency that were furious about the decision to um, take the Calhoun statue down. Um, there were folks in our community that wanted to see the Calhoun statue melted, thrown off the, uh, thrown off the uh, Ravenel Bridge, uh, turned into a, a reef for fish offshore in the Atlantic Ocean, you know, discarded. And uh, it was important for me, and I think we've heard this evening from the panelists and also Dr. Matthews and some of the historians um, earlier this evening, that, that 
perhaps that's not the appropriate path to take with um, divisive uh, uh, symbols such as this. I, I've, I've always been more from the school of thought that says, you know, whereas Mr. Calhoun certainly doesn't belong 100 or so feet up in the air above even some of the church steeples uh, in, in the city of Charleston, uh, he doesn't belong in the, in the garbage can either. I mean, for, for better or for worse, he's part of the American story. He's part of the South Carolina story. He's a former vice president, uh, for crying out loud. So, um, you know, my perspective has always been to certainly remove him. I was 100% behind that decision. But we also need to find a, a, a place where the story can be told in a respectful uh, manner. And, and I ultimately uh, believe that's what we'll do. Um, I got death threats after the Calhoun statue was removed. Um, some of my colleagues on city council had their businesses boycotted. And I'm not coming up here to, you know, uh, you know complain or, or uh, cry woe is me. People have had it much, 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 much worse than I've had it in, in my relatively privileged life. But it got real in the summer of 2020 around the city of Charleston. And, um, Sorry about that. All right. Um, you want me to start from the beginning? I'm just kidding. Um, I'll, spare, I'll spare everybody that. Um, but, um, you know, I, I got to be honest. Um, and this is, uh, this is some, some truth I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell here. Um, I think that's what we're encouraged to do this evening. Um, I bought a gun after I got death threats. And people were posting uh, my address uh, on social media and rallying mobs and I was on these YouTube videos and all, these, all this different kind of craziness. Um, there is not a person in my family that has ever owned a gun. Um, and that, it just goes to show you that what we do um, in this position uh, can sometimes have, um, you know, some pretty serious real world implications. Thank you, uh, Senator. I appreciate that. I think my, my mic has about had it. Um, so we've all had a very uh, unique experience over the past two and a half years or so, um, but I'm convinced that the city of Charleston has navigated um, certainly the Calhoun issue properly. There's still a lot more to go. There's other controversies around, but by bringing in uh, a diverse set of voices and perspectives uh, and having you know, respectful, open dialogue and discussion, we can chart the best course for our uh, community moving forward. And that's the most important thing. So thank you, everybody. We've heard the word balance several times tonight. So we cannot rename buildings. We cannot remove statues. So the only way to try to achieve some balance is to erect statues or name unnamed buildings for heroes of our past. Richard T. Greener was the first uh, uh, black man to graduate from Harvard College in his own autobiography, he said, I was too white to be black and too black to be white. There's evidence that Harvard didn't know he was black when they admitted him. But nevertheless, following the Civil War, uh, he had his Harvard diploma. South Carolina College was the only Southern university to reopen admitting uh, formerly enslaved uh, uh, black people. Uh, we had black faculty. The Board of Trustees was majority black, Donald Bailey, and uh, it was, of course, then closed and reopened as a, as a segregated university for men. But we did erect a statue to Richard T. Greener. I asked, what is the most walked upon place on the whole university campus? And the answer was right between the Russell House, the Student Union, and the library. Thomas Cooper, that's another name we have to deal with. And there's a beautiful, imposing statue. And often, I'll walk around in the evening and see students, people, visitors, white and black, by the way, reading the marker. Congressman Clyburn was there when we dedicated it. We have uh, other markers on campus. It doesn't really assuage our community, though. The students don't believe that that is the kind of university or the kind of balance that they're really seeking. So let's go back for a minute then to the, and I know you don't want to talk about it anymore, Senator, but the Heritage Act. There just appears to be, I guess, something we've got to live with. There's no real germane, there's no public 
uh, antagonism about it. And so, and by the way, Strom Thurmond is the building that it, that's the biggest flashpoint on our campus. He's also, of course, on the state house grounds as well, where, where you work every day. I guess we've got to keep telling our students and our faculty and our visitors, our constituents, I guess that that's the way it's got to be. Well, um, I think what you saw uh, from the Supreme Court, South Carolina Supreme Court, is that the pertinent part of the supermajority uh, provision in the Heritage Act was ruled unconstitutional. And so what you're seeing now, uh, and I know of at least four examples, are colleges and universities. For example, Clemson University has asked the legislature to take the name of Ben Pitchfork Tillman uh, off of one of its buildings. Uh, you mentioned the University of South Carolina, uh, Dr. Sims, Marion Sims. He was a gynecologist who experimented on African-American women without the use of anesthesia. Uh, and a number of local governments are also petitioning the legislature. And so we know now, uh, although, that, although that we haven't been able to vote on the removal of any of these uh, relics, largely because we are dominated in the General Assembly by one party, the Republican Party has controlled the state legislature for over 20 years and they're simply tone deaf to this conversation. So when a legislator does file a bill to uh, accommodate the request of a public university or any other municipality, uh, it stalls in committee. There are two examples of that. Um, and so I think the path is for us to uh, now get a majority, uh, South Carolina, state constitution allows the General Assembly to pass laws by a majority. The Heritage Act was accepted from that. You had to have two thirds. And so now we have a path and that path, uh, many have requested for us to use it. So we will see uh, whether or not we can get passed uh, and get a majority. Now that's gonna be difficult to do. Uh, in the Senate, we lost three seats in the 2000 election, uh, and so the Senate is uh, 30, 30 Republicans to 16 Democrats, and in the House, uh, there are 80 some odd Republicans to 40 uh, Democrats. And so um, it, it's gonna be politically diff difficult to nav navigate and carry out the request. Let me say this briefly about the Heritage Act. Many have complained about the Heritage Act. And I understand that the compromise was to have the Confederate battle flag in front of the State House, uh, along next to a Confederate soldier monument that was already there. But the reality in the year 2000 is that you had four Confederate flags flying in the State House one in the House, one in the Senate one above the state house dome and one in the lobby. And so when the compromise was brokered to remove four for one, uh, many at the time thought that that was a compromise we could live with. I was not in uh, the General Assembly. I did not get elected until 20, uh, 2013, uh, my first year was 2014, so fortunately that, that, that had already been done. Uh, and so now, uh, in the aftermath of the tragedy uh, that happened here at Mother Emanuel, or across the street at Mother Emanuel, we were able to move that one last flag uh, that was in front of the State House, now that's gone. And so that's progress. That's real progress, but I wanted to give the audience some semblance of how many flags they were. And I've talked to the members who used to have to go into that chamber, much as uh, uh, Councilman Middleton has stated, the, the feeling uh, of uh, shame and embarrassment 
uh, that many African American members had to face every day as they pledged allegiance to the flag and the Confederate flag was in, in front of the chamber. And so the other thing that was brokered in the Heritage Act, many people don't know this, was the full, the full funding of an African-American monument, uh, which you see on the State House grounds. It was not only built, but funded uh, by the, uh, the budget. And also, there was a commitment made during that time to explore this idea of an international African-American museum. And so the Heritage Act, you know, in, 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 in hindsight, many people question the wisdom of why would the General Assembly allow one flag, the Confederate flag, to fly in front of the State House, but in exchange they got four removed and full funding for an African American uh, monument on the grounds and a commitment, a financial commitment, uh, to build the African American Museum. Uh, Mayor, the uh, History Commission in Charleston, there were about 100, more than 100 recommendations. Not all of them have been promulgated. Are they, are they dead? Where do we go from here? They're not dead. That special commission made some recommendations. They were not accepted by city council, uh, but we have formed a, uh, we call it um, the HART, Human Affairs um, Racial Conciliation Commission. It'll be having its first meeting, by the way, organizational meeting next week, and one of their tasks is to uh, take up those recommendations. But may I respond to the Heritage Act question as well, if y'all don't mind? Um, I would say personally that it's a shame that we even had a Heritage Act. As the Senator mentioned, it was really just to create a compromise regarding the Confederate flag, and the thing was, the flag was put on top of the state house in, in 1961. Um, it was recommended by a Charleston legislator just to simply commemorate the 150th anniversary of the beginning of the Civil War. And, and the intent was that after a year, we come down. It was just there for a commemorative purpose, and then it never did. And then we have how many hours and years of debate and, and angst over this ever since. But um, the other thing I, I wanted to share about um, the act is that um, the, the legislature also passed, I think in 1974, something called the Home Rule Act, which is supposed to uh, uh, honor the wishes of local government. So I'm fine, Senator, if y'all want to have an act that, can, that uh, specifies what ought to go on state property, but we believe down here in the city of Charleston, and I bet the county of Charleston feels the same way, that we've grown up enough, we can make our own decisions about uh, such things, about what we would like to have in our community. Have at it, have at it. And then <laughs> thirdly, I, I do want to point out that the, uh, w the city of Charleston, we, we try to follow state law. Um, we checked with the attorney general before the removal of the Calhoun statue, and it was not subject to the Heritage Act. Um, you know, Mr. Calhoun was not a war, and he was not a war figure. So um, it simply did not apply. So when the moment was right, and the city council of Charleston unanimously agreed to do what we did, and we were speaking as elected officials for the will of our city at that time, um, I believe the right thing is to let local government closest to the people make those kinds of decisions. Thank you. I was at the uh, NCAA when we voted there uh, never to hold postseason competition in this state while the Confederate flag uh, was still flying. And I came back kind of a little smug, go to the General Assembly saying, I got this. You know, I got this. They're going to take it down now because it's all about football, you know, and basketball. Not so whatsoever. Stubborn, stubborn, stubborn. Reverend Middleton, uh, where, do we, where do we go from here? How, how does a community make decisions when uh, there is no unanimity, of course? Does, is it town hall? Is it a simple vote? Is it like every other political decision in the world or... Uh, are moral issues different in how they're adjudicated? 
I think there has to be a moral imperative, and certainly as an elected official, I don't think elect, elected officials can solve everything. I think at some point uh, the grassroots, uh, the community, uh, the people, you know, they have to rise up and they have to demand certain things. And I think I heard someone say, uh, or maybe you said it just a minute ago, there, there's not that, you know, sort of communal societal imperative that then, you know, sort of creates that moment for some of these things to happen. And I think, you know, there are some things that get our attention, particularly at maybe a, an inflection point brought on, brought upon by crisis. We experience what we experienced here in Charleston with the Mother Emanuel uh, massacre. Many of us lost loved ones in that massacre. And that created, particularly with Senator Pinckney, who also, you know, served in, uh, in the legislature, you know, the sort of, uh, well, I mean, you all debated all along. I mean, so I guess not. You know, I, I was about to say it, it created the empathy, but, you know, it, it did not happen easily. Uh, here in the city of Charleston, when we were grappling with the issue of slavery and, and crafting an apology to repudiate and denun denunciate and, and to really, you know, apologize as a city because the city enriched itself. We learned a whole lot through that, through that uh, entire education process, how the city uh, and the city council and city government, because they had the workhouse, they had uh, certain things that individuals, if they were too tired to beat their slaves, they could then, or the enslaved people, they could take them to the workhouse and pay a fee and whatever the case was and the city handled that. And so at some point we need the community. And I know people are working, people are busy, people are engaged in different things, uh, but the community itself has to then uh, send a message to those who are sitting in these seats uh, representing them that there are certain things that are priorities for the community and that includes uh, justice. That includes issues of conciliation, reconciliation. And in order for there to be uh, reconciliation, you know, Desmond Tutu said there, there has to be a proper confrontation. And sometimes when we bring these issues up, uh, individuals as, uh, as Cleveland Sellers would put it, they, they are outside agitators. And, and it requires that level of agitation in order for the issue to rise to the level of importance that individuals start paying attention. We need people paying attention. Uh, and not that they are not necessarily concerned, but when you look at those issues that literally hit you at your front door, <laughs> to include issues of you know, racial stress and racial injustice and systemic uh, wrongs, then we have to come to a place within our society that we call those things out particularly when you look even locally at school systems and you look at uh, de facto segregation, when you look at from the state perspective, you know, inequitable funding formulas. I mean, there are so many systemic things that should be addressed in order for us to move forward in a productive, peaceful, and in a very um, collaborative way that enables the empowerment economically, socially, um, and, and, and just literally the human spirit of every individual that lives. And so when we look at the nature of how we do this, it requires these type forums. The Charleston Forum is extremely important. Other town halls, I host them myself on certain issues. We had the Glenn McConnell widening. You know, that was a, you know, an issue of great importance in my district and people turned out at 526. I mean, they're you know, emailing me to death no offense, those who don't want it. <laughs> and so, you know, there are issues when these things come up that really, you know, kind of grind uh, the gears of individuals, but we need these moral issues as well uh, to take uh, preeminence, precedence, and to really become uh, those things that we talk about uh, in a very constructive way. We, we would have okra soup suppers, you know, where we had dialogues where individuals would sit down at tables and, and really talk about those hard issues, particularly relating to policing and other issues in our society. It requires more of these conversations because when we talk about these things, I think we recognize that we have more in common than those things that are different. Councilman, why, why does it seem always to take tragedy? You know? Well, I think that um, tragedies have a way of waking people up. And it, it's, it's uh, you can't turn away from what happened in Charleston a few blocks from here uh, all those years ago. And that was the tragedy that led to the final flag coming down. And 
It's a shame that that has to happen. It's a shame that we have to restart these discussions after tragedies. And we just had a tragedy in Texas with a school shooting. We just had a tragedy in another mass shooting, a uh, racially oriented mass shooting up in Buffalo. These very dramatic, spectacular, horrific tragedies are what get blasted through the media, get blasted through social media, they dominate the news cycle, and it whips up a lot of emotion and discussion and debate. And it's a shame that that's what it takes. And I think it's a product of um, something that Reverend uh, Middleton just mentioned a minute ago is that, you know, people in our, um, in our, in our communities are extremely busy and they're extremely uh, burdened with kids and work and school and this and that in this day and age of social media and limited attention spans and forget 24 hour news cycles, more like 24 second news cycles. Um, it is very hard to uh, initiate and sustain this, the type of um, complicated discussions and debates that are necessary to move the needle forward. Um, you know, there's been tremendous progress in this country on racial issues. I mean, what took place in the 1960s is truly unbelievable and it's truly revolutionary. Um, my, my microphone is not quite revolutionary uh, this evening. Oh, there we go. I can, that's booming. Um, you know, there's no question the vestiges of racism are still with us in, in society. Um, but not every one of those vestiges is a statue that's hovering 100 feet over the ground. Uh, we've got racism baked into complicated places. For example, our zoning and land use regulations. Now, before everybody goes to sleep, when I, when I start talking about this issue, it is boring, it is dry, Very it is important. technical, but let me tell you, it's extremely important, and oh, by the way, it just so happens to be that the city, one of the issues the city of Charleston has the most control over, it's actually an area of home rule that really exists. You know, we don't have it with statues, we don't have it with finance, uh, but we've got it with land use. Um, did you know that zoning has its origins in overt explicit racism. Okay, zoning, well, this is an educated group here. Um, so I think that uh, this is not uh, representative of the folks that I speak to because that blows a lot of people's minds when I tell people that. I'm a zoning and land use attorney. I've got a little bit of a background in this area. And um, you know, after reconstruction, I'll give a little, little brief um, you know, kind of summary on this just to illustrate the insidiousness of some of the last vestiges of, of, of racism in our, in our country. After Reconstruction, you, know, you had African Americans moving up to the Midwest, up north. You had folks up there that wanted to make sure that African Americans and, and whites stayed apart. And so the first attempts were to use the government power to actually designate white districts of the city and black districts of the city. In fact, the city of Charleston actually had that in, in place. The court struck that down. You know, we had the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, you know, in the early 1900s. You couldn't do that. That was a little bit too much on the nose. So some very clever uh, folks at the time found the same way to get the same result. We were gonna zone by different types of housing. So your single family housing was gonna be over there. Your multifamily housing was gonna be over there by the steel mill, by the railroad tracks, by the more disadvantaged parts of the community. That ordinance was challenged. And the United States Supreme Court um, in the Euclid versus City of, uh, I, I'm sorry, the uh, City of Euclid versus Ambler Realty case, a 1923 Supreme Court decision, um, upheld zoning for the first time as a lawful use of the police power. You know, zoning is not, uh, uh, you know, on the Ten Commandments. It's not a law of nature. It's something we came up with in this country. And the Supreme Court recognized it in the opinion, it referred to apartment dwellers as parasites. Okay, that's the history of zoning and our land use regulations. And so fast forward today, we got zoning ordinances on the books in the city of Charleston. So does the county. So do jurisdictions all over the state and all over the country. And it produces the 95% white district that I represent. The neighborhood I live in was developed in a time in the 1940s when the only way you could get financing if you were a developer to build a neighborhood 
was to uh, get federal, you know, uh, guaranteed loans and backing. Well, the regulations, the federal regulations at the time required you to have restrictive covenants in there that said you can't sell to African Americans. Because at the time, the idea was that was necessary to preserve property values and peace and things of that nature. These are the things, the legacies of those decisions, which you don't have to go back to, you know, uh, 1619 or the Civil War. You can go back to the Eisenhower administration. This wasn't that long ago, and a lot of that persists to this time. So when I hear a term, critical race theory, I think of let's critically examine our land use policies, our zoning policies, to make sure we're not creating a situation where we're incentivizing and encouraging gentrification. Should it cost twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars for people to change their windows on the east side or on the west side in the city of Charleston with our architectural review guidelines? These are not necessarily evil intended regulations, but they can have very negative impacts on communities that we care about. And so as we move forward in the city of Charleston, and we look to the recommendations in, in the report that um, the Race and Equity Commission has provided, we have the tools and we have the ability to make meaningful change on the ground. Now, is it gonna get people excited? Can you put this kind of stuff on a, on a poster and, and, and march about it? Probably not, it's too boring to get people out. Um, we're talking about very technical stuff, but this is where the game is right now, in my opinion, um, on some of these very complex, policy-oriented issues. It's not fun, it's not sexy, but that's the way we've got to uh, go to make meaningful progress on the ground. And it's gonna take that sort of sustained commitment that um, Reverend Middleton just talked about and support from um, the community because it's gonna be um, really uh, a challenge because it's gonna be you know, changing the status quo and oftentimes that's not easy, but it's important and we need to get it done. Thank you. No, no meeting in Charleston could avoid zoning. I knew that was going to come up one way or another. I'm delighted to see young people here. I'm just so happy to see you guys here. Uh, we have to start with young people, I believe. And, Mayor, I'll ask you uh, whether we do enough in Charleston to educate young people about the problems we have here and everywhere, the problems of race, the problems of, of uh, disparities, and uh, is there more that uh, whether with the tourist community or with our, with our own people, you know, how do, we, how do we prevent the tragedies of the future and how do we uh, raise the awareness of people by starting young? So on the tourism front, I would say we're doing better, but as a general rule, I would answer your question, no. We're not doing enough. And, and um, some of the things that I've even found out over the last few years serving as mayor about the history of our city and our state. I never read in the South Carolina history book when I was your age. They didn't put these stories there and that's why I, I generally believe we have to do a better job of telling the full story and that's why it's important to support things like our um, International African American Museum. And then you go up to pardon me, Senator, you go up to Columbia and y'all want to tell us what not to teach in, uh, in the state legislature. Like you want to put a, a, a lid on it, a damper, not you personally, but the, the legislature, you know what I mean. And so that seems contrary to what I believe we need to do. And that's tell more of the story and, and do more public art and more um, uh, history that tells a more complete story. And I, I just want to give two little examples, and, and some of these things take a while. But, but someone mentioned in the uh, audience that I spoke with right before we started, you know, Mayor, I, it wasn't so much the Calhoun statue, but I never saw any statues that looked like me. And um, I was so uh, pleased to have a gift a few months ago of a statue of a young, a young girl her, 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 um, it's down now. We just installed it at the waterfront park. It's a young African American girl. And she was only six years at the time. And, and her sculpture is just one of pure joy and hope for the future. And it's right near, uh, the fountain and close to where, uh, as you place your statue, where so many people come to waterfront park. 
you know, that, that putting that kind of public art out. And by the way, now she's a junior at the Citadel uh, and about to graduate in, in, in one year and, and it's, will pursue a medical profession. And another example, uh, July 13th, I invite you all to join us at 10 o'clock in the morning down uh, next to the old city jail, which is the location, Kylon, next to where the workhouse used to be. And, and based upon that story we uncovered, which was part of our apology for slavery, an important part of it, as, as Kylon brief, briefly shared with you a minute ago, we uh, ran through our history commission and approved a history storyboard that tells the story about the workhouse in Charleston and where it was located. And it's going to be right on the site of where the workhouse used to be with an image of it. It looks it looked very similar to the old jail there. So uh, we have to continue to add to the story. It's, it's, it's not so much about taking away. That I, I, again, I feel the Calhoun statue was very um, particular case that I tried to describe earlier. We need to add to the story, tell more of the history. Y'all need to know where we all came from in this state, and that's how you shape where you're going to go in the future. You got to know where you came from in order to know where you're going. You're right. Memory, you know, memory is a fleeting thing. We uh, just opened an Anne Frank Center on campus, and we're finding that you know, it's a difficult topic to bring school children, but we're opening up to teachers and children from around the state, and we're finding that 10, age 10, is not, not too young uh, to learn the lessons uh, of the past. Uh, if you do uh, surveys of young people around the country, even Jewish young people, the majority can't define the Holocaust and our racial issues. You know, that, that's why taking things away in many cases is a good thing, but don't take memory away, don't take history away. So, other, other thoughts? Sure. I think I'll take this partially uh, as an educator and spending the last six months uh, as an interim principal in one of our school systems here. Uh, it's my joy uh, to in, engage young, young people in a way, because I think we minimize their, their ability to understand, you know, specifically how to interact one with another. Um, racism is a learned behavior. It is nothing that, you know, someone is born with. Um, separation, segregation, those types of um, social cognitive, you know, dynamics, those things are constructed. Those things are not born or innate. And so when we look at young people, they're the hope for the, for the future. And I, I watch them on playgrounds. I watch them in cafeterias. I watch them uh, in um, recess or times where they uh, have their own ability to kind of hang out and be. And they are extremely open, <laughs> very open to every possibility of learning and discovering and interacting with people who are not like themselves and celebrating that and, 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 and really embracing that diversity. And somewhere along the way, something happens to that. And so I think that as we you know, look at the nature of how we uh, capitalize on the, uh, the, 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 the very open nature of our young people, we need to find opportunities. Mayor, I remember speaking uh, years ago at your council on youth, children, and you know, families, whatever the case is, that there are so many engaging ways to bring young people together, to put them in uh, sessions and forums where they are able to interact with other young people from other districts, other areas, those who uh, may be in a, from a more urban context can learn from those who are from, you know, a more rural context so that they might be able to understand, you know, the sort of plight that other people are experiencing, especially when we talk about broadband issues and we talk about connectivity issues that some people don't experience, but other people, uh, they have a real challenge, which becomes almost like the superhighway uh, for the future. So when we look at churches uh, and faith houses of worship and the faith community, uh, all of us have young people and young people's departments to include, uh, you know, ecumenically and or interfaith that we can begin to engage our young people. When we look at the summer months, we're planning vacation Bible school in our tradition, but that does not preclude. I remember when I was a boy, we would go hopping from vacation Bible school to vacation Bible school. And we've started partnering with, with churches that are, you know, Second Presbyterian Church, uh, St. Stephen's, Episcopal Church, churches that have, um, you know, that are not black, you know, and, and sharing 
those types of vacation Bible school experiences so that those young people can have an experience that they never would have had if we did not intentionally design that and bring that together. Uh, right now, we have a racial justice pilgrimage uh, between St. Stephen's Church and Mount Zion. They are in uh, Atlanta and uh, in Alabama right now. Uh, and young people we sent on that trip as well to share together, to learn together, to grow together, and to bring back uh, an experience that will transform. And so I think that the hope and the future lies within our young people, and we have to give them you know, that grown up, you know, Anne Frank in her diaries, I, when they were in that annex and up, you know, in, in that space, I mean, they, they had to grapple with real issues. And she uh, chronicled those in a very, um, in a way that we still read today. So young people have the capacity, they have the ability. And so if we bring them together, if we engage them, if we uh, enable them uh, to bring that to life, I think we will find that they will shape our future in ways that we can't imagine. Yes. Senator. Yes, I, uh, I think the best way we can create um, uh, more productive young people, uh, uh, the two, two, really twofold. Number one, um, they need to know history, and we are it was just able to secure uh, $4 million for Mother Emanuel Foundation. Uh, they will be opening a foundation to teach social justice and commemorate uh, the lives of the deceased nine and survivors. Uh, we were able to use the budget, uh, approximately two or three, actually it may have been a little longer than that, uh, to secure funding for the African-American Museum out of the state budget of, to the tune of 15 to 20 million dollars. Um, and that just didn't happen. Uh, we worked uh, in the aftermath of tragedies and used it as an opportunity to leverage economics. Uh, and so going forward, what I intend to do and which, which I've been doing is each of us are part of an ecosystem with our respective budgets. Uh, I don't know what the city of Charleston's budget is, but I suspect it's in excess of a billion, uh, two, 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 200 million, including the, the ARPA funds and American Rescue. Okay, all right. And what is the county of Charleston's budget? 700 million, so closer to a billion. State budget is about uh, $9 billion or more. Now, all of us have uh, diversity initiatives within those budgets. There are state goals, uh, there are city goals, and county goals. I've looked at the P&Ls from many uh, governmental institutions, and the procurement goals are not really being met. Uh, and what we have to do is focus on economics in our community because if you drive, leave, 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 uh, leave this building and drive, drive down the street, you won't see or very few African American owned businesses. That used to not be the case. And so we have to make sure that we look at our respective budgets. And if there's a goal not being met, we need to meet those goals. Now, here's what you will find when you pull out the MBE, or the Minority Business Enterprise number. Um, you will find that the contracts are being awarded to white women. In often the case, you have white men contractors who are using their wives to take advantage of a resource that should otherwise go to a minority group. At the lowest category of every uh, metric and every report that I've looked at, African American entrepreneurs and business people are at the bottom. And so in order to change and galvanize and educate our young people, be productive citizens, we're going to have to change the economic paradigm. 
uh, because programs that were created for people who have had a history of being disenfranchised, we are not getting those opportunities. Now, what I intend to do, and the mayor, I will applaud the mayor, he is going to create a, 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 um, a business incubator, which I applaud. And this concept is simply this, as we did with the tech corridor. Uh, Charleston is really now on the map for the number of tech businesses uh, that have located the Charleston, but we, 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 we subsidize many of those businesses to come here. And so we gave them subsidized rent downtown, which is very high. Uh, you know, a lot of businesses can't afford to open downtown. Uh, until a certain period of time, they were able to get on their feet, and now many of them have opened up offices on Meeting Street uh, in this new tech corridor. In my view, we ought to be doing the same with African-American businesses. We need to set up a corridor where we subsidize, and I think you're going to do this, and I want to help you. Uh, part of my initiative in this budget is to request several million dollars to help the mayor out with this initiative. But I think that it's my responsibility when we talk about children and we talk about uh, where we go in the aftermath of the shooting, it's an economic solution, and I appreciate the history lesson on the flags, but we've spent far too much time on those issues, and we haven't really addressed the problem that plagues our community, a desert of economic activity. We have a number of people who are so creative, but they're spending time, and Dr. Hink, who studies gun violence, can tell you this, uh, they are just aimlessly wandering through the streets and picking up guns. Let's tap into that collective creativity and give them entrepreneurial talents and foster that entrepreneurship through government incentives. That's just my view. The barriers are baked in. As was said before, beautiful book by Isabel Wilkerson called Cast. How many of you? have read that book. It's a wonderful book, uh, eye-opening, to know that it was, you know, governmental policies at the federal level that were designed to keep people down, to keep black people down, of course they were. And so it's not, you know, it's, they're baked in. And so we need to go down to the roots and try to break those barriers up. You know, no GI Bill for returning black soldiers, uh, no uh, uh, home mortgages for returning black soldiers. Uh, it's just uh, the stories of Matthew Perry, who came back from the war and saw uh, Italian prisoners of war being better taken care of uh, in a diner that he wasn't allowed to eat at as an American war uh, hero. And so uh, we've, uh, all of these new, new things are great, but we also have to look at the, uh, uh, the reasons why things uh, are the way they are and, uh, and keep moving forward. Other thoughts? Well, we'll see how long this stays on. Um, it's kind of good to have microphones that shut off automatically when you have a bunch of politicians um, speaking. It sort of helps to kind of keep us to a minimum. But, um, and I applaud Senator Kimson's comments about black entrepreneurship and black businesses and, and things of that nature in the city of Charleston. But we also need to have African Americans stay in the city of Charleston. Um, because if you look at the census data from 2020 and you look at the census data from 2010 and 20, 2000, you know, last 20 years, the numbers are deteriorating rapidly. Okay. There's a, and you're going to see this coming up soon in our city council, uh, redistricting process. The county's got their act together. They figured this out months ago, but we still haven't even gone public with our maps yet, but the maps are responsive to demographics and population change. And the peninsula is hemorrhaging African-American population, and really the rest of the city is as well, even in parts of West Ashley um, and James Island, where, where I am. And so we're going back to zoning. We're coming back for the second time around. Please, please don't go to sleep. Um, we have to find ways to get more affordable housing built in the city of Charleston, full stop, full stop. It is really one of the most uh, defining challenges of our time. And it's so important because if we don't get this right, 
we're not going to have a diverse community. We're not going to have the next um, generation of young African-American children to harness, to get through the incubator, to become entrepreneurs, to become, um, you know, invested in the city of Charleston. So um, how, how do we do that? City of Charleston is doing tremendous work right now with our community development department, uh, Gianna Shaw Johnson under the mayor's leadership, um, has, do, has done a tremendous job leveraging very limited resources to putting um, thousands of units of affordable housing on the market. But we just recently completed our city's comprehensive plan. We need 16,000 units of affordable housing over the next 10 years. We're not going to meet that goal on the path that we're on right now. It's just, it's just the government can only do so much to subsidize our way out of the problem. Fundamentally, it's a market problem. It's too expensive to build housing. And it's, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Our zoning ordinances limit how much you can build. It makes it very complicated to get developments going. Um, we've got to look at those rules because ultimately, at the end of the day, Price is dictated by supply and demand. E even, even my brain can understand that concept. We don't have a demand problem. A lot of people want to live in the city of Charleston. We've got a supply problem. We've got to find ways to get more housing built, and we'll take it however we can get it. If we can get it through um, public-funded, uh, incentivized programs, let's do it. But until we find a way to unlock the private market and make it so that affordable housing can make money to developers, we're not going to achieve those goals. And I'm not talking about cutting down, you know, the Francis Marion Forest or, or, or sprawling closer to Savannah. I'm talking about finding ways to build where we already have infrastructure, where we already have roads, where we already have water and sewer. Let's build on the peninsula. Would you believe that in the 1930s, there were close to 80,000 people that lived on the peninsula in the city of Charleston? The number's like around 30 right now. That's, that's crazy in my book. There should be over 100,000 people living on, the city, living on the peninsula of the city of Charleston. Rich, poor, white, black, everything in between. That's how you have a strong, resilient, diverse, interesting, dynamic community where teachers and firefighters and police officers can live in the city in which they work. This is the challenge of our time. It's, it's a race issue. It's an uh, equity issue. Um, and it goes far beyond that. And these are the kind of issues where you, if you take the time and you, and you talk to people about this and, and, you, and you beat that first instinct to, to doze off, and y'all have passed that test wildly. I don't see anybody sleeping in the audience. That's, that's rare for me, I got to tell you. Um, you can find people reach common ground on this issue. There's a way to appeal to conservative people, Republicans, on this issue. We're talking about deregulating. We're talking about the private sector. And you've, you can, of course, appeal to the more liberal and progressive folks as well, because the end result is socially positive. So these are the ways we can build bridges in the future, by connecting not on inflammatory phrases and buzzwords and things that shut down conversation, but by talking about discrete issues, specific examples, things that the city of Charleston can actually do. I wish at the city of Charleston we could pass an ordinance outlawing racism. We do it, we do it tomorrow. But we don't have that kind of power. But we can tweak our zoning rules, we can tweak our development regulations, do it in a balanced way that doesn't adversely impact you know, existing communities and things like that. These are the things we can do to actually make a difference. And the people in government that are interested in making that kind of change are certainly the people we need to be electing and the people that we want to be uh, leading the way here. So let's, let's keep a dynamic, diverse population. Let's give them the tools they need and let's make a better future for the city of Charleston and the rest of the state. Almost out of time. Reverend, closing thought from you? Certainly, I, I think one of our uh, questions that we didn't really get to, you know, talked about the divisiveness of our civil discourse and just our communities and you know can we ever solve that and I think that uh, as we talked about earlier just having these type forums finding common ground showing people you know the commonalities that exist uh, within our society I remember when we were planning for the uh, 
the 350th um, anniversary of Charleston that COVID sort of co-opted, uh, we were going to have this long table on Broad Street where everybody would be able to come together. And, and so those types of opportunities for us to rally together as a community, not necessarily only uh, in the back aftermath of tragedy, but certainly in times of triumph, in times of celebration, in times that are resilient, that enable us to recognize you know, that we're all Charlestonians and we're strong together. And so I think that as we contemplate Charleston moving forward, um, we have to unite in order to be the city that May I add a friendly amendment and break bread together, break bread as together. well. Let's thank our wonderful panelists, please. <laughs>